Could Myanmar be on a path to democracy? The country holds its second election since the end of military rule. But with minorities excluded, will the outcome lead to real change? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Myanmar is preparing to go to the polls on Sunday for its second general election. That's despite a growing number of COVID infections and conflicts in some states. In 2015, the National League for Democracy won the first parliamentary election, ending the military's tight grip on power that had lasted more than 50 years. It's widely expected that the NLD party of Nobel Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi will retain power, despite being internationally criticized for its handling of the 2017 military crackdown on Rohingya Muslims. Meanwhile, more than one million people in conflict areas have had their right to vote canceled by the government, raising concerns over the credibility of Myanmar's election. Scott Heidler explains. It's been five years since the people of Myanmar went to the polls in a general election, and only the second time they'll cast ballots since the nation emerged from 50 years of military rule. But no surprises are expected. The National League for Democracy, or NLD, headed by the high-profile and one-time symbol of democracy, Aung San Suu Kyi, is expected to maintain its ruling position. But with reform slow and stalled economic growth and peace talks, their victory is not expected to be a landslide as in 2015. To change the whole system, five years is just a short period. We were under the dictatorship for more than 40 years, and this is the start of the democracy. We need more time. I can give the NLD more time. They couldn't change anything for us. That's why I don't like the NLD at all. For me personally, I just don't like the NLD. The turnout for the election is expected to be lower than the estimated 70 percent five years ago because the nation is facing a second wave of COVID-19, but also because some ethnic areas won't even have polling. The government citing insecurity due to ongoing fighting between the army and armed ethnic groups. This, along with other rules and regulations, have raised concern by human rights groups about the fairness of the election. Despite facing international condemnation for its 2017 military crackdown in Rakhine State, sending hundreds of thousands of ethnic Muslim Rohingya fleeing to Bangladesh, Aung San Suu Kyi is still very popular at home. Broadly, people have really billed this as a kind of test of Aung San Suu Kyi's popularity and also more or less like a referendum on the achievements and failures of, the, uh, of her administration. But actually, I think obviously the key, key issues are things like the virulent wave of COVID the countries are now fighting. Even with the anticipated victory for the NLD and its 75-year-old leader, there's growing concern about the lack of depth within the party's leadership. Aung San Suu Kyi has not positioned anyone to be a potential successor. So any sudden changes could lead to a political crisis. Scott Heidler, Al Jazeera. Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, is the largest country in Southeast Asia. Since gaining its independence from British rule in 1948, the country has been battered by civil war. The conflict began a year later when power was unexpectedly handed to the majority Burmans, excluding many ethnic minorities. In 1962, Myanmar was under an oppressive military junta that lasted more than 50 years. Gradual liberalization began in 2010, leading to free elections in 2015 and the establishment of a civilian government led by Aung San Suu Kyi. In 2017, a military crackdown against the Muslim Rohingya forced more than 700,000 to flee to neighboring Bangladesh in what the UN called a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. This damaged the international reputation of the newly elected government and highlighted the continuing grip of the military in Myanmar. All right, let's bring in our guests. Nikki Diamond is a human rights specialist at Fortify Rights. He joins us from Yangon in Myanmar. Tun Kin is president of the Burmese Rohingya Organization UK and joins us from London. And joining us from Bangkok is Phil Robertson, deputy director of Human Rights Watch's Asia Division. Welcome to each of you. Nikki, let me start with you. In Myanmar, there was a wave of optimism and a sense of hope that greeted National League for Democracy's victory in 2015. What is the sentiment around this election cycle? 
it, it is a little bit hard to sell, but I've seen uh, most of the people uh, calling a no vote campaign. So one of the issues is that they don't trust in uh, on sensitivity government right now. And also, I have seen that most of the people who support for Aung San Suu Kyi now a kind of backlash again hard, and they will not vote for NLD again. So people, a lot of people frustrated uh, government uh, uh, policy and uh, implementation concerning with the human rights situation as well as uh, government other performance as well. Phil, Human Rights Watch has repeatedly called these elections fundamentally flawed. What are the electoral problems that you've identified? Well, there are quite a few. First of all, we've got d discriminatory citizenship and other laws that bar uh, most Rohingya Muslims, uh, 600,000 who are still in Rakhine State and another 1.1 million who've been forced to flee to Bangladesh from being involved at all. Uh, they're not considered citizens. Uh, the 2008 Constitution reserves 25% of the parliamentary seats for the military. Uh, they're appointed by the Army uh, Commander-in-Chief. So you're talking about uh, the re uh, requirement for anybody to actually get a working majority in the national parliament. You have to actually win 67 percent of the seats, uh, either as a sole party or as a coalition of parties, uh, to overcome that 25 percent uh, set aside for the military. And that's quite unclear, uh, quite unfair. And there's big problems with the uh, supposedly independent Union Election Commission, which is proving to be anything but... Uh, independent uh, or even basically competent. Tun, you've, you've stated that you are concerned about the lack of international condemnation of the disenfranchisement of the Rohingya in this election. What do you worry could happen as a result? I think uh, it's a quite worrying situation because, you know, international community uh, we've been campaigning and advocating that uh, this uh, Rohingya citizenship issue for many years. And then we can see here uh, uh, this 2020 election exclusion. And there is no such condition international community have. And, you know, they instead Rohingya uh, are excluded from election. They are funding to UEC uh, racist commission. I worry that this really encourage to the military, same time to the government, they can move forward further human rights abuses and violation, particularly as you know, like Rohingya areas in Arkana State, the on genos ongoing genocide is uh, practicing, uh, policies practicing against Rohingya. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, much more worrying that, you know, um, Everyday Rohingya daily life, Rohingyas are facing uh, crimes, uh, you know, by their Burmese military. And same time, government is uh, not allowing enough humanitarian aid access. You know, also restriction of movement, marriage are still on top of that. So, how much further situation can get worse? You know, it can be much, much worse. So, there is one point that, of course. Burmese military and government practicing genocidal policies and encouragement to this election will mm. be much, much worse. And I worry that uh, uh, it, could, it, it, it will be much further. And it's really encouraging point. One of the uh, important thing here is, you know, so they can mm. go on with, they can kill anyone. They can do whatever they want to Rohingyas. So nobody can, nobody caring about it, you know. As still, they excluded that international community supported it, funding it, you know. So this is the point here I want to point out. Nikki, many analysts have said that at its core, this election is really a referendum on Aung San Suu Kyi. Would you agree with that assessment? I think that one of the, I mean, uh, primary concern for me is, I mean, majority still believe in uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and also people, I mean, uh, hope for Aung San Suu Kyi is never dying. But also, they are, on the other hand, there are increased number of uh, people who lost their hope in uh, NLD and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. So one of the problems is the stand on the human rights situation, especially on the Rohingya situation in Rakhine, and also other ethnic minority. So her treatment, again, uh, current situation in Rakhine, I, I think one... 1.5 million voters from the ethnic minority in conflict-affected area 
like the Rakhine and Shen State are not allowed to participate in this year election. So I've seen enough evidence of the political disfranchisement, so which make people more crazy and backlash again her uh, current uh, situation. And also UEC is, I mean, uh, Union Election Formation must be uh, a kind of uh, non partisan But every five years, elected government have to appoint the member of the election commission, uh, union election commission member. So now they became a kind of uh, in favor of the current government. So which make me which make me uh, frustration, uh, frustrated, and also uh, the unfair treatment again mm. and exclude a Rohingya as well as a religious minority in Myanmar. So that's a kind of I mean uh, indicator that. Uh, in, increased number of uh, people, I mean, uh, losing hope in NLD. Phil, we've already spoken a lot in this program about Rakhine State, about the persecution that the Rohingya have faced at the hands of Myanmar's military. Um, but I'd like you to give our viewers a bigger picture of, of what exactly is playing out in Rakhine State, because you have the continued persecution that's been reported of the Rohingya, but then you also have um, other ethnic groups that are involved uh, in the violence that is going on there. How dire is the situation and who exactly is being affected? Well, it is a very, very difficult situation in Rakhine State. And most of the voters uh, in Rakhine State are not going to be able to vote in this election because the election for their areas have been canceled. It will only be in the sort of uh, uh, southernmost districts of uh, Rakhine State where the election will probably still be held. I mean, we have the Rohingya, uh, approximately 600,000 of them are estimated to still be in Rakhine State. Uh, we know that at least 130,000 of them are locked down in what is essentially internment camps where they are uh, unable to leave those areas. They are stripped of their livelihoods. They lack basic services. And certainly they're not allowed the right to vote. But then, uh, you know, that's the, the Rohingya. But the, the ethnic Rakhine, who are the other major ethnic group in the, in the country, uh, are now in, uh, involved uh, through uh, a... Uh, ethnic armed organization, the Arakan Army, in very, very fierce fighting with the Burmese military. Uh, it's probably the most uh, serious fighting going on anywhere in the country right now. And uh, what you have is uh, attacks by the military on civilians. You've had shelling of villages. You've had uh, use of uh, landmines and IEDs. Um, you know, we've had abductions of people by the Arakan Army, including uh, three NLD candidates. Uh, so it is a, a very dire situation. I mean, uh, we see that crimes against humanity are being committed not only against the Rohingya, but also against the Rakhine people by the Burmese military. It's, it's really rather amazing that, you know, the, the Myanmar military has managed to commit crimes against both uh, ethnic groups uh, in Rakhine state. And, uh, you know, this is an area where uh, the people are uh, were unified in 2015 in supporting a, a party that was not the NLD, um, uh, and uh, that party won the state elections, uh, but it was not allowed to uh, become chief minister. And that's going to be an issue again this year. Is even if uh, ethnic parties win in their actual states, uh, the national government, whoever wins that, and most people believe that will be the NLD are the ones who appoint uh, essentially the chief minister or, or the governor of that state or province. Tun, there have been many rights groups uh, that have called upon the government in Myanmar to allow Rohingya candidates to run for office, uh, that have called on the government to allow for Rohingya to be able to vote. Of course, we all know that's not happening now. Were you at no. any point in the process hopeful that things might change or is this playing out as you had expected it to play out? Uh, for now, tomorrow election, 2020 election, there is uh, um, going to be going ahead. I think for the 2025, it depends on how international pressure is do, uh, really working, how international community really care about as a whole Burma, including other minorities in Burma, you know. Uh, exclusion of Rohingya is not really a good, uh, um, a good thing for, uh, not really um, important for international community because they are still supporting Union Election Commission, Racist Commission, 
and uh, they're moving ahead, including U.S., U.K., and EU and other countries. This is really, really disturbing, you know. Mm. So it depends on how much international community will pay attention, one thing. And secondly, uh, it's not only Rohingya. It's an apartheid election when banning the Rohingyas in ethnic uh, you know, ethnic minorities will suffer much more because 1.5 million people are barred from election. This is very important point when you look at as a whole uh, election in Burma. So I think it depends how our new government mm. uh, feel pressure from international level and funding issue in in the future. Uh, there is, should be a condition that without, uh, uh, you know, this is not a kind of, uh, we, we, have, we, are, we are seeing a 2020 election is not free and fair at all. And international community should focus on without any minority exclusion, there is no such thing they can support mm. funding UEC. And uh, they should not acknowledge even new government whenever come up after these two, three days after that this is not this government is not uh, uh, not appear a kind of like uh, um, you know recognition they should not give because this is totally flawed election they come up from from the Tun, uh, 2020 Tun, election. I'm sorry to so, interrupt but let me I, I want to go to Nikki because I want him to expand on a point that you're making if that's okay uh, Nikki um, you know last year Aung San Suu Kyi appeared in the International Court of Justice and denied the charges that have been leveled against Myanmar for perpetrating a genocide, uh, as the Gambia alleges. Um, and that's something that made Aung San Suu Kyi's reputation suffer even more in the international community. It diminished it even more. But in, but in Myanmar itself, that's something that's bolstered her popularity, has it not? Yeah, that's the one, one, one evidence that we, we have seen. And also, one of the major thing is she's defending the human rights violation, the defending the perpetrator and whitewashing. So that's 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 the major thing why she lose her face in internationally. And also in Myanmar, so international media investigated journalism revealed the Indian, Indian incident and also other and also perpetrator like the two soldier in the hate testifying again. Uh, Perpetrator. So these kinds of revealing the true story make number of people think twice. And also, I've seen the civil society backlash against, against her government and even her. So that's a kinds of. I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, I feel like uh, that kinds of ongoing uh, 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 revealing a true and uh, investigated journalism, investigating human rights. I mean, uh, a group documenting uh, human rights violations. So mm. that is a. Pressure against Myanmar, against Myanmar government now, and also people. Sometimes people don't trust in uh, human rights organization and human rights docu documentation, but they cannot deny the evidence revealed by the various group and uh, various uh, uh, international community as well. So right now, people are now thinking like, uh, uh, why is she uh, doing the white wash for the military perpetrator? That's why uh, people in Myanmar now considering. Uh, I mean, a kind of supporting for her against the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, how can I say it? It's like uh, uh, losing international, uh, uh, f her in international and also losing uh, her support in uh, domestic uh, within the country as well. Phil, I, I want to turn our viewers' attention to, to, to something else that, that's been going on for several years in Myanmar, which is the spread of hate speech, particularly through social media channels. I mean, this has been a, a, a serious problem dating back several years a, at this point. And, and apparently, it's a problem again in this election cycle, that hate speech is spreading against certain ethnic groups there throughout the country. Now, there are platforms like Facebook that have said that they are clamping down, uh, that the problem is getting under control. From your vantage point, is that the case, or is it, again, a huge problem, and is it, once again, dangerous for different minorities in Myanmar? Well, I think that uh, Facebook has put a lot more resources in this time around. Um, they got caught flat-footed several years back uh, by the hate speech campaign that came out against the Rohingya, um, and really um, 
uh, you know, there was a great deal of harm done through the Facebook platform. Uh, you know, the whole issue went all the way up to Mark Zuckerberg. So this is a, a real priority for Facebook to try to get it right. And, and for all intents and purposes, Facebook is the social media medium uh, that it matters in Myanmar. And so we're, we're talking about uh, hate speech. It's all about them getting it right. And we are seeing uh, them try to do more, but it's, a, you know, they're playing a game of whack-a-mole, to be honest. I mean, they're trying to uh, take uh, hate speech off the platform, but more of it comes up. Uh, certainly the uh, the Union Solidarity and Development uh, Party, the USDP, which is the major uh, party backed by the military, has been saying racist things uh, against the Rohingya and has been denigrating Muslims in general uh, throughout the entire country. Uh, the actual head of that party, the USDP party, has said some of these things on the record. Uh, and so it's quite clear that there is a current of discrimination and hate uh, being uh, particularly projected against uh, the Muslim people who are in Myanmar. And the government has said nothing about it. Uh, that's the shocking thing. They've sort of left it to Facebook to deal with it. But the reality is that the government itself doesn't want to say anything and doesn't want to do anything to uh, stop these uh, hate speech campaigns from going forward. Tun, you know, a lot of analysts have said that this election is another important test for Myanmar as it is making its transition away from military rule. Do you believe that, that Myanmar is actually making a transition away from military rule? I don't think so, because I can't see that civilian government led by Aung San Suu Kyi is really... Uh, practicing democracy. There is no such freedom of media there. And uh, even the state media is not allowing opposition, you know, to highlight things. And the state media is controlling in many ways. And, you know, also there is... Uh, one thing is, let's have a look on Rohingya issue. How can a democratic transition can go where, where uh, you know, a one majority Rohingya... Uh, about one million population is still in Bangladesh where they belong, you know, where Rohingya belongs to Burma and they flat are still there is no such thing government is doing to bring back them to give them their rights where, you know, Rohingya are living in Arkana State Time Memorial and 600,000 Rohingya, you know, excluded right to vote and right to be member of parliament and we cannot see anything policy towards Rohingya and minorities being changed in under NLD government. Tun, of course, many people are telling that our oh, military I'm, is controlling, but NLD government is current. Tun, government my apologies, Tun. We only I'm yeah. sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just we, we only have about a minute left, and I want to ask one more question uh, about the military to Nikki before we end the show. Nikki, in Myanmar, it's the military that essentially still controls the levers of power. Is that correct? Yeah, somehow it's correct because the uh, 2008 constitution provides the special, I mean, a lot of power to the military. But every political party who go under the 2008 constitution share the political power with the military. Whoever elected, they have to share with the military, the political power with the military. That's why, I mean, um, NLD wanted to win the election to control the a kind of 75 percent or, I mean, majority seat at the parliament. One of the things, I mean, I talked to this get with the ethnic uh, political activists. So they, NLD doesn't like to share their political part, uh, political power with ethnic uh, democratic um, uh, democratic uh, forces. Mm. So that's a kind of war. Plan. So most of the time, I mean, uh, whenever this constitution exists, every elected government will share with the uh, 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 power with the military. Mm. All right. We've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much to all our guests, Nikki Diamond, Tun Kin, and Phil Robertson. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.